first and foremost, thank you for you all coming out. One, for you, all those of you who are looking to become homeowners, a perfect step to take. Um, again, I have the privilege of being the deputy director at S St. Louis Development Corporation. I'm a transplant into St. Louis. Uh, but I think it's really important for you all to understand that I, I'm rooted in the space that you all live in. Um, it is really exciting in this moment in time to be working in an organization that has some alignment that I think this city has never seen before. As a black man who identifies as a black man, this city I don't think has seen this much black leadership mm -hmm. in position at the same time actually working from the same sheet of music. Not in the same book, but actually on the same page in the same book singing the church hymnal. It's exciting for me to be in this moment in time. SLDC has a strong reputation historically of being an organization that's focused on economic development projects that are large scale. Thinking big box, right? The big things that create big jobs. It's important for us to do that. And I think that's going to always be a part of who we are. It will always be a part of a function that we have to play as a part of the economic development landscape. But I want to switch you to the next slide is we have to start to think about some of the fundamental reasons why SLDC exists. I happen to be in graduate school, so if I start to throw out some language, please just say, dude, change it up, shorten it down so we can all understand what you're saying. But here's the reality. The data proves itself out in a number of different ways. The Del Mar divide is real in this city and in this part of the community, in Dutch town and areas, is real. There are parts of the city that the math and economics work really well. And when you think about this community in North City, the economics don't add up. When we think about the realities of the gaps between white homeowners and the ability to grow and scale, there's not a criticism to European Americans or white people who have home ownership. This is about getting to what my sister said about institution and structural racism. We play a part in that. So I have to just pause and go, yes, our organization plays a part in that, and we have to be better in how we participate in the process of dismantling things that create barriers for access to growth and development. Next slide for me, sir. Um, it is really thoughtful around where people are being denied. It is really thoughtful and critical that we didn't get to where we are today by happen chance. So I want to take us to have a moment, just pause for a minute. That where we sit today, someone orchestrated a plan to get us here. St. Louis used to be the place of home for about 980,000 people. It is now home to about 285,000 people. Pause. Mm. Wow. Now, when we think about the economic opportunity that exists, that's a pretty significant gap. So imagine you live on a block with 10 homes, people are living there, and seven people leave. And the community is used to supporting the cost of keeping the streets clean, curbs to dealt with, trees trimmed. Now there's three families left to tend to that task. That is what we're dealing with in the city of St. Louis. And so as I continue to grow and learn and, and pay attention to what's happening in St. Louis, here's the reality. My organization has a core competency that is not about economic development. That's what we do. That's an asset. That's an action. We do provide TIFs and incentives. That's an action. Our fundamental core competency is, is to take assets that we own and control, put them back on a tax roll to have generating revenue to support the infrastructure of the city. Who would agree with that? Anybody, anybody disagree with that? I mean, who disagrees with that? Right? Because I think when we think about SLDC, we think about projects like the NGA, which everywhere I go, man, NGA, I'm like, that's one project. But projects of that scale don't necessarily transform neighborhoods like Dutchtown. They don't necessarily transform neighborhoods like Old North or any other neighborhood where you find community nodes and you have small businesses who are working to keep each other supported. Economic development is about how we work together to collaborate, to bring the tools we have to work collectively to bring about that change. Have you slide for the next slide for me, my friend? Um, then we all know we've heard COVID. COVID's real, it's still here, it's not going anywhere anytime soon, uh, in the reality of how our economics 
have been impacted. Whether it's supply chain, whether it's about how we think about living in proximity to one another. And so as we think about that, we have to be mindful that the impacts of COVID are exacerbated in places like Dutchtown or exacerbated in places like Old North. And we have to find ways to really leverage that opportunity and that situation to create change. Um, so when you think about our great city, right, when you think about qualified census tracts and meeting HUD criteria, you have all of down here <laughs> where we're hanging out today and all above Del Mar, Washington, up north. So how do we get there? Anybody know how we got there? How do we get to two very broad pieces of our city getting to a place where you have the majority of people living under poverty? Targeted investment, targeted disinvestment? One thing. Homeowners Law Corporation, 1937. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, anything else? Redlining, right, mass, here's the one, great, the great flight, right, when we think about where opportunity goes, when we think about North County, and I come from a place called Minneapolis, Minnesota, and, and it's interesting, most major cities that I go to, North City is the place where we forget to invest. I don't know if that's just the North Star, we forget that North is the kind of thing that guides, I don't know, but Minneapolis, North Side, and Chicago is the North Side, St. Louis is the North Side, uh, and, and so it's interesting. But here's the reality. I know everyone in this room wants to be a part of, I'm going to not say the American dream, but just the real dream of a human. Because the American dream isn't necessarily my dream, so I'm going to be really honest about that. That narrative isn't mine. But here's what I do believe, and I think everyone in this room believes in the same thing. Quality job, safe place to call home, good access for your children, for a good home to live in. I think I don't care where you come from, what ethnicity you live in, that you come from, what place you, what's your socioeconomics, those are all the same things, right? That, that's the common denominator, but we don't spend our time on the common denominator, we think about the gaps. So when I say that, I wanna make sure you understand that ARPA money is, is this has been my narrative, is a one hit wonder. It's Milli Vanilli in the music industry, <laughs> right? It is pow, one song, man, we jam on it, we found out they were lip syncing the whole time, Man, we don't like them anymore. But ARPA money is one hit wonder. And so the thing I've been trying to challenge all my colleagues to think about is how do we really leverage resources that is a one-time opportunity? One time. And so when you imagine as an individual, if someone said, man, if I gave you $100 million one time, what would you do? Right? And I'm going to ask you all a question. If you all got, make, we'll make it equitable. If you all had $100,000 one time, what would you do for yourself and your community? Anybody? What would you do? Cleveland High School. Cleveland High School? That's what's up. <laughs> Anything, what would you do with $100,000? Open a business. Yeah, start a business employ neighborhood people. Cool, right? So what I just heard is people thinking about the future. Right. Not the moment today, but if I had money today, I would invest in something for tomorrow. Here's the challenge I have, is I get to be the steward, and some of you may or may not know this, but uh, LRA, our Land Revitalization Authority, is the oldest land bank in the country. Celebrating, I believe, 50 years, Zach, this year? 51. 51. Um, so I started working at SODC, and my, my boss said, Lance, you know, we want to change things around and have you lead LRA. I'm like, really? Man, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but but think, my first it, it, that sucks, right? Because I'm the new guy coming to the city, and also now I'm the worst landlord in the city, like all in one breath, right? It's like, hey, how you doing? Welcome, and by the way, you fix your property. It's like, well, I just got here, right? But these things are real, though. I think it's about understanding that I take this serious. I laugh. I try to have humor about it, but it's real that when we look at these places, I have ownership, stewardship, more importantly, in a lot of these places. So can you go to the next slide for me, my friend? Um, it's really being thoughtful about how do we create equitable opportunities. And I'm not talking equality. And I'm going to give you all an analogy that I use that I'm, helps understand this picture, that I'm not talking about equality or equal distribution of stuff. I am talking about if I have a slice of bread, I am not trying to take my peanut butter and spread it over the entire piece of bread <coughs> to have an even bite. 
because someone on one corner of that bread has been hungry a lot longer than someone else. They need more peanut butter, get a little more protein. And so when I think about the role that I have inside SLDC and thinking about our work moving forward, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about our economic justice action plan, which is really Neil Richardson kind of brainchild of taking our equitable development framework that you all have heard came through in existence, I think a year and a half ago, uh, at the city has some 450 pages worth of stuff that says like, that's a lot, right? But who's gonna do it? Anybody seen anybody do something out of that plan yet? I haven't. All I know is I have a lot of people saying, Lance, you gotta do page 55 through 99, page 100 to 105, right? But I can't do that. So I have to be thoughtful on how do I activate an organization to really bring about change. So our economic justice action plan is the framework to help us decide, based upon our core competency, what is the role that SLDC plays in moving forward. And in that, it's around four key tenets, but we're actually cooking it a little bit to boil it down to the three. But it's this notion of business empowerment. There was about five or six entrepreneurs that raised their hands in the room, right? Who the business owners? Um, yeah, I was almost old, I'm getting old. Um, but here's the deal. In building communities, small businesses still generate 85% of net new jobs. So if we're talking about equitable access to employment, I need black and brown people to be able to thrive so they can hire black and brown people. That is not a disrespect for anyone who's a white business owner to say that you won't hire black and brown people. That's not the case. But statistically, it's proven out that black and brown owners hire black and brown people. And so we want to support that when we think about the city of St. Louis and the demographics. How do we shift the ownership model and really get black and brown people in ownership models versus being renters? Like I'm excited about all of you trying to become homeowners. I think it's really important because then you have a stake in the ground, right? You have legitimacy in the sense of ownership. Because last time I checked, the guy I serve ain't building more land. So that's the case. We've got to get our piece. That's the 40 acres, and we've got to grab it on our own terms to make it happen. And so the other part, don't change. The other part is when we think about business empowerment, workforce comes behind it, right? As businesses grow, jobs get created. This is about neighborhood transformation. And I mentioned that SODC has a history of doing large-scale projects. We are moving on a pivot, and I'm being really transparent about the pivot. It's not walking away from large-scale projects, but it's about building neighborhoods. At the end of any day, we all identify with the place we come from. I used to ask people, where's your come from place? And go, what are you talking about? And I tell people, I come from collard greens, catfish, and light bread on Saturday afternoon. That's the country boy in me. When I grew up, that's what I grew up with. But there's a set of values that come with that. That when you do that, you have neighbors who come break bread with you. When you do that, you also know the family who doesn't have a lot. You take them a plate because you know they're not going to come out and ask for it. So that's what that come from place means. And I found to realize that St. Louis has an abundance of people who come from the very same thing, but they may have lutefish or barbecue ribs as the thing that creates community. And I think it's really important for us to think about what that looks like. And that economic development has to center in small corridors. You all have heard the notion about how the dollar spends in any given place. If I can have a doctor, lawyer, grocery store, dentist, a uh, therapist, which I think is important, so I'm, I'm going to say therapist a couple of times. If y'all ask me what I would do with ARPA money, I get every person in this city a couple hours of therapy. Yeah. Facts. <laughs> but we're, but, hey, we're, we're in this moment in time, we're hurting in ways that we don't, we're not aware of. Uh, I go every other week. I'm good. We think about it. But I think it's important to think about that, right? And so as we think about this pivot, we have to understand that it is about neighborhoods and recycling the dollar. Because I know for a fact where I live, I live in, in Benton Park, I get to walk to a couple of really nice restaurants, right? I get to walk and where I know that they're, they live around the corner. Everyone doesn't have that privilege to be able to walk to a restaurant or walk to a corner store that's owned by someone who looks like them. And I think if we start to think about economic development in that space, we can really start to transform things. Um, and so I'm going to run through this really fast. Um, we are working on this economic justice action plan uh, with the hopes of rolling it out sometime in April, uh, right around the time the mayor does her state of the city address. Uh, but as a part of that economic justice action plan, we're also thinking about uh, how do we re-incentivize? When I mentioned about competitive advantage, we're the only entity that really has the ability to provide incentives to economic development projects. And so we have to be thoughtful around the tool that we have and how we use it better. 
to help sustain growth in places where economic development needs to happen. Just have you go to the next slide for me, sir. Um, and so a huge part of what we're trying to do is take the current $29.1 million that I have stewardship of, that's really interesting for the new guy to come into town, you become the slumlord, and then you're also the guy who has the money, all in the same <laughs> breath. Um, and, and you have people say, well, Lance, we need some money over here. I've been in a neighborhood meeting last night, probably one tomorrow, Lance, our neighborhood needs all this money. And I'm like, that's probably true, but I can't do that, right? And being honest and transparent. And it's about finding ways to really leverage resources that I have in my disposal. And some of the ways that I want to do it is really being able to support small businesses, uh, really growing and thriving, but really finding those opportunities that can create that volcanic eruption. And people say, Lance, volcanoes destroy things. In some cases, they do get rid of bad stuff. But man, lava is some of the most fertile soil on the other side of the opportunity to grow it. Right, you can grow some really phenomenal stuff. But I say that to say the $29 million is going in a couple of different directions. I think the context that's important for this conversation is, and I didn't share this with you, Nate, uh, which I probably should have before today, um, is, <laughs> now that I think about it, <laughs> I mean, I should have talked to you. Um, we have $20 million that's going towards affordable housing. And when I say affordable housing, I mean housing affordability in the sense of a teacher can afford to live in a house or an individual person who's single, yes, ma'am. Uh, can live in a house. That's when I talk about affordability. So $20 million is going that direction with 10 million of it going towards a new market tax rate revolving loan fund that can do it scale. Then I'm looking to deploy the other portion of that $20 million to enhance our Prop and S program, not necessarily put more money into Prop and S, but to put money alongside Prop and S to help us do some work that makes sense. So you talk about Prop and S for those who don't know. Uh, so, prop in, and I may have my colleague jump in and give me all the real clarity around it. Uh, but here, so imagine I have property that I own, LRA, we own. We actually have a program that can bring some dollars to bear to stabilize the house and then can be sold to a homeowner who wants to buy a house that needs to be rehabbed. That's the simplest way to describe it. Nate, I mean not Nate, but Zach, did I do it? That's the simplest way, yeah. Okay, trying to be simple today. <laughs> <laughs> Be an LRA property. Yes, it has to be an LRA, something that LRA owns and it's in our portfolio. What I'm in, attempting to do is be able to stand up another pool of resources uh, that can actually, one, not necessarily be in that same program, but say, how do we move from stabilization to redevelopment and allowing an individual to be able to, you know, I talked to a gentleman in the back uh, about this notion, I'm, I'm trying to find me a lending partner who will play with me and do a 504 lookalike. So then I can bring $150,000 maybe to a closing and then have a borrower bring $50,000 and then that 150 dollars stays with the property moving forward. And a 504 is for small businesses. Uh, 504, I want to help small businesses that way too, but a 504 look like for residents, right? So a purchase rehab. Uh, so if, who does purchase rehabs in the room? Anybody? Okay. Uh, so make sure we talk. Um, so it's really about trying to find a way for me to bring resources to the table to support a homeowner being able to get into a home that they can build or re rehabilitate with us bringing some equity to the table and then them financing just the gap. Uh, and so you move into home ownership and you have instant equity. And I think that's what ARPA money is designed for, is to accelerate the market in a real fast way, in a way that we can get maybe 80 houses in, back on the market. Uh, and I'm, I want to focus on duplexes for the reason why we've been talking. She talked about she just bought her house at 50. Uh, a homeowner at 80% to 50% AMI, getting a mortgage that they can afford, and it's in a duplex. They have affordable ownership. They can create affordable rental opportunities, and we really build community really strong. And so I'm really, I'm really excited about that, and so I think that's the important piece that I want to stay close with Dutch Town on as we kind of build that out uh, to make sure we're sharing information about that program when it rolls out for families who are looking to be purchasing a purchase rehab and being a part of that program. So. I think that's my last slide, I think. Uh, so I just want to say thank you all so very much for your courage to move into home ownership. It is a journey that will benefit not only you, but your family and create legacy. So thank you for all that you do, and we wish you well. Good.